Support for current conversations is provided by Outreach Video and Media Services, University of Oklahoma Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. The show today is about indigenous social issues, and we have two very special guests. We will talk with the Vice Chancellor of the University of Alaska, Yvonne Peter, and policy analyst Sadelta Oshawi about indigenous education, civil rights, and public policy. Join us for a discussion of Native America. Vice Chancellor Yvonne Peter uh, from the University of Alaska, welcome to Current Conversations. It's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So is there a strong tradition at the University of Alaska of having uh, tribally identified people in positions like yours to serve students effectively? Um, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the history in Alaska is very similar to the history in, in the continental United States with colonization, um, assimilation policies. Um, you know, my, my grandparents, for example, weren't even citizens in our own homeland. And I grew up with my grandfather in my village, so this is not a long ago history in, in my experience. And my mother uh, grew up during the boarding school era, was sent off, um, you know, basically being forced to give up who she is, her language, her identity, um, as a part of that uh, forced assimilation process. And so we suffered a lot of the same discrimination, uh, segregation. We had segregated schools. Native people weren't allowed to shop in stores, own businesses. And so naturally, the university was not a welcoming place. Wait, say the last part again. Uh, people weren't allowed to shop. What? Shop in stores. You know, there there were there were signs and doors that would read "No dogs, no natives," for example. Wow. Um, wow. And this, so, what were they supposed to do? To, to buy goods, get somebody to shop for them, or something? Are likely, uh, you know, there were some stores that would allow native people. You know, just like I think in in probably similar to some of the history, um, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the, again, in the continental United States, there were always some people within every society who understood the injustice and inequity in, in the situation that existed. I think a lot of people hearing this for the first time, maybe they don't know anything about Alaska universities, would just assume that there are administrators there who can understand the uh, issues uh, of the students actually at the university, which would be, it seems to be a no brainer that you should be there, somebody like you. So that wasn't the case. So no. w what was the pressure that brought you in or another well, indigenous administrator? I, I have to honor the legacy of indigenous leaders before me that really paved the way for Alaska Native people to have a place and a space within the institution at, at an administrative faculty and student level. And mm -hmm. so I'm certainly, I'm the second Alaska Native person to serve as, as a vice chancellor at the university. The first was the late Bernice Joseph, who um, passed away very young. And she was actually on my graduate committee. Mm -hmm. She was one of my first bosses when I moved out of the village as a teenager to the city. And so um, I had known her for a long time, but she was one of the champions of pushing her way into the system and saying, look, um, Alaska Native people should have a, a high place in the institution, be able to be a part of the decision makers who really determine how we move forward with our mission as an institution. And, um, and so I have to acknowledge some of those early forebears before me in, in, that, in that work. But what had happened is there, there was a you know, major civil rights movement. You know, I, I, couldn't, I put it into a 100 year plus context for our Alaska people to work towards having a right to citizenship, right to vote, uh, having a right to own land in our own land. Um, right to uh, vote. Yeah. So when did that happen? What's the uh, similar to all the American Indian people, Native Americans in, in the continental U.S., the 1924 Indian mm -hmm. Citizenship Act also applied to Alaska Native people. Mm -hmm. So in 1924, um, but then we had the Jim Crow laws up there, just just mm -hmm. like down here, where we're you know we're excluded from being able to vote. Actually, prior to 1924, the, in Southeast Alaska, where they had some of the longest contact with settler um, communities and people. Uh, they, they had determined a process to get citizenship and a vote for some Native people, but they had to have something like, I should have researched this before this interview, but something like eight non-Native people to declare that you are civilized and you had to give up your language, your identity, and you had to sign on a document saying you are no longer Native mm -hmm. in, in order to be able to, to vote. 
Um, and very few people, of course, went through that process uh, prior to the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. But when, when, I, when I first came out of uh, Vashrenko, which is the village I come from, a very small village, we, like I said, I was living there with my grandfather and my uncle, single room cabin, no electricity, no running water. We were 200 miles from the nearest piece of cement. People, if you were ever to go there, wouldn't believe you were in the United States. And um, Guchin was the primary language being spoken. And uh, so I grew up in this really tight knit community of 100 people, hundreds of miles from anywhere. You could walk 100 miles in any direction and just see the land. Maybe you'll run into 100,000 caribou migrating freely as they did you know, for thousands of years, and as they still do to this day, unobstructed by fences or industry or development. And so that's the land, the openness that I, that I came from. And when I, when I moved down into the city, we, we were, like most Native people, stuck in low-income housing because we didn't have, you know, uh, we were impoverished in that setting. And uh, I remember I was in junior high and they grabbed all the young Native men and they put us in a room one day and they said, look, you boys, odds are, statistically, that you're more likely to end up dead or in jail by the time you're 25 than you are to graduate high school. And sadly, those statistics um, largely stand true. And um, I myself was one of those statistics. Ended up being a high school dropout, didn't finish. And, and, uh, and you know, one, of, one of, I think there was about 12 or 13 of us in the room at that time, one took his own life within about a year. Um, I think maybe only one or two of us that were in that room finished high school. So the, you know, the, the legal system in Alaska is very much similar to here. We have very high numbers of Alaska Native people, especially Alaska Native men, um, who are incarcerated. Some completely unjustly incarcerated, many actually. Mm -hmm. We just had a major case called the Fairbanks Four, where we had four young men that are from my generation who spent something like 17 years in prison for a crime they did not do, and there was zero evidence in yeah. the courtroom to, and, and yet they were still convicted, and they were, they were finally just recently exonerated by the, by the governor. Um, and so they're, they're free again. And these young men are incredible because they maintain a deep sense of spirituality and connection um, to their identity, to a cause. And um, they're, they're some of our most powerful advocates now for our young people. And, and, this, and their, their story is going to go national here very soon with probably many documentaries and shows that are going to come out. Uh, now, didn't you also do a feature film recently on uh, suicides of uh, young people in Alaska? Yeah. So we, we just finished producing a film called We Breathe Again. It'll go uh, national on September 26th on um, PBS on a show called America Reframed, which is actually housed in the World Channel. Give us the title one more time. We Breathe Again. OK, We Breathe and, Again. And, uh, and in that documentary, we really wanted to follow the lives of four Alaska Native people documenting the impacts of intergenerational trauma and suicide. Um, you know, we wanted to rate, um, show a lens into the experience of our people, ultimately for it to be a, a film that can add value and healing among our own people. But also, you know, we realize that our story is a human story. And it, and it has relevance for cultures and people around the world who are suffering from the impacts of, you know, hundreds of years of colonization that um, all of us have been impacted by in some way or another. And and so, you know, we're, we we really feel like the the stories that we we're able to capture um, over several years years of filming will will really um, shine a light on some important insights and stories. And so we're excited that the, the film was picked up and is going to be. You know, uh, I'm, I'm so struck that uh, the kind of thing you're doing right this moment as we're talking, where you're, you're speaking very directly about things that have happened and uh, social conditions in Alaska and, and sort of the new Jim Crow issues up there, et cetera, uh, how little space there is in the culture for this kind of story to be told. You know, you, you'd think that given the magnitude of these problems, we'd be talking about this all the time. But what you're doing very effectively, I think, right now, there's just precious little of. Uh, it just doesn't get out there very much. Well, you know, as, as Native American, Alaska Native people, we're technically, statistically insignificant. So we never show up in the big national polls on, uh, you know, whether it's suicide rates, housing, electricity, running water, quality of life, um, uh, economic status and situations. And, and so, you know, we're, we're certainly among the most marginalized people in this country, and, and it's in our own home, which is, you know, the, the, the crazy piece of that ex experience that we have. 
our, our chiefs met uh, for the first time in 1915 with uh, a representative of the federal government and uh, declared their statement of interest in maintaining our way of life, living our life from on the land, um, having uh, access to jobs that were beginning to be created and access to education. And so even that long ago, they were aware of the importance of those things. Now, pushing forward from that 1915, uh, a major piece of uh, legislation occurred in Alaska when we were still a territory, the territory of Alaska in 1945. There was a, a really substantial debate that was being championed by a woman named Elizabeth Pratrovich, and it, it later became the Alaska Anti-Discrimination Act. And I think it was one of the first, if not the first, civil rights era pieces of legislation that mm. forced desegregation to occur, mm. forced the signs to come off the, the buildings of the no dogs, no natives, forced uh, the ability for our people to sit anywhere we wanted in movie theaters, you know, all these things. And that, and that was back in, in, in 1945. And so, and then after that, that really pushed forward a groundswell. And of course, um, Martin Luther King down here, um, elevating the issues of civil rights among uh, other peoples of color, really helped inspire a, a greater wave as well in Alaska. And so we had in the 1960s, uh, the Alaska Native leaders, a lot of them really young, basically publicly and in federal court saying, this is our land. We own it, we have a claim to it, and the US has to address it. And, and so really that pressure that was put forward by um, Alaska Native leaders in, in the 60s um, resulted, resulted in the passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in 1971, where well, whereby, depending on what lens you look at it, uh, we were stripped of most of our lands, but they, but they left 44 million acres w with us. And 44 million acres can sound like a lot unless you realize that there are 424 million acres mm -hmm. in, in Alaska yeah. of, of land. And so the vast majority of our land was taken. And I've heard some people say there really needs to be a comparative study between the Dawes Act and the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act as to how much land was actually stripped from indigenous people. through. through what was the ownership of that land in kind of a, a, a award situation with the government where there, were, there was sort of federal oversight or was it truly the given to the people that, indigenous people that claimed it? The 44 million acres? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so it was really, and I don't want to get too technical yeah. into the, because this could be a whole other show, right. focusing just on the Native Claims Settlement Act, but the by that time, the federal government had a lot of experience with colonization and assimilation practices in lower 48, and so they didn't want to go with a, a reservation system, even though there were already some reservations established in Alaska. Like my tribe, for example, we, we owned 1.8 million acres of land. We actually utilized the Indian Reorganization Act, which was extended to Alaska in 1936 to declare our land. And we, we were awarded uh, 1.8 million acres. Shortly thereafter, Congress quit awarding these uh, reservations in Alaska, because I think they realized that if they award all 229 tribes, 1.8 million acres, that's some 410 million acres. We'd own most of our own lands. And you know what colonizing country wants to enact legislation that allowed indigenous peoples to own their own lands? So, so, they, so there was only um, some five or so reservations established in Alaska before Congress quit approving those, those applications. Um, so when ANCSCA came along, they, they really undermined our tribal authority. And they didn't gift, not gift, they didn't leave that the remaining land that they didn't take. Um, to our tribes uh, and 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 our um, well yeah to our tribes and our nations, they created for-profit corporations, and they gave those corporations the land, and they made our people become shareholders of the corporation. So they stuck us into a corporate structure with the intention of them reaping profit off of the land. That's what I was looking for. I and, was just and, assuming and, and, it's and, not wasn't so, going to be that simple. No, yeah. and and so really, um, you know, from a critical theory lens, uh, ANGSCA was a brilliant piece of assimilative legislation that put our people into a corporate model of hierarchy and exploitation. Yeah. And um, on the flip side, it did give our people, um, it forced a generation of people to become very savvy at running large institutions mm -hmm. and understanding the politics of economics mm -hmm. and economy and to leverage that power to affect change elsewhere within our state. And so that, that's why it's, yeah, it's a yeah. double-edged sword. Right. So, so we, we now are in a situation, or we began to be in a situation in the 70s, where we started to have all of a sudden some real political clout. We, we own land that was recognized by the federal government uh, through indigenous controlled institutions. Um, and 
and tribes. And, uh, and by the way, on my reservation, we refused to participate in the Native Claims Settlement Act, mm -hmm. and, uh, but they extinguished our reservation status and they moved our land into fee simple title. And so we, my tribe still owns our land, 1.8 million acres in fee simple status. Um, and I think we're one of the largest, if not the largest private land holders in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we, we were able to retain our original tribal governance structure and ownership over our land. I mean, a few other uh, tribes in Alaska were able to do that as well, but the, the majority ended up being in this corporate system. Now the interview with Sadelta Ashawi. The question I'm going to ask now could be a whole other show, but I, I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> okay. You know, we, we could think about sort of the dual original sins of the United States as mm -hmm. slavery and Indian removal. Right. And, and, it, and it feels like maybe we get a little closer dealing with historical trauma with mm -hmm. slavery. It, um, the culture it doesn't seem to be very close to dealing with indigenous issues. Mm -hmm. And um, they need yeah. to be dealt with. Right. I, why? I mean, there's never been a Supreme Court, indigenous Supreme Court justice, right. for example. Right. You can just go on with that right. list way, way down the list. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't we closer on that? It would just seem like to be a no-brainer. We need to right. talk about our past. We, it, it's true. Um, I think it's because we're just invisible. Um, part of it is the statistics. You know, we're such a small percentage of the population, and most people never have interactions with other tribal people. A lot of the times it's only through a mascot or some other kind of demeaning way that they yeah. have any kind of context point for Native people. You know, we were at this screening last night, More Than a Word, it's an incredible documentary, and there was a Q&A after, and one of the, the people said, I just didn't know this was an issue. And my friend looked at me, she said, how do they not know this is an issue? <laughs> and I told her, I was like, because they don't, we live in a different universe. We, as a kid, I thought everyone was Native American. I thought everyone was Indian. Because I grew up in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. <laughs> everyone in Tahlequah was Indian. They're all Cherokee. Uh, when I went up to North Dakota, I would pick up my aunt in Nebraska and my cousin, and they're Indian. And I have people in Minneapolis and Montana all over. We had family, and they're all Indian. So I just assumed we're all Indian, you know? And I remember as a kid, I was looking at a history book one summer because I was a nerd and I read all the time. And I was like, oh, the population, it says we're less than 1%. That must be a typo. So I walked up to my mom. I was like, mom, it says 1%. And she was like, it's like, my mom doesn't know either. <laughs> like, she's wrong on this too, which is crazy. It wasn't until I left that I realized that that bubble that I lived in, and I think we have this social media bubble now because all of my friends are very active and they're, they have all these issues. They're always coming up on my timeline, on my feed. But if you don't have anyone in your life that has that perspective, you don't see that story. You know, yeah, I, I think you're talking about something very simple but very mm -hmm. powerful, that there are millions of Americans. Right. I, I'm going to say this, but I think right. it's true, who've either never met right. a black person right. or never known, right. really known a black person right. and possibly never met an indigenous right. person. Millions. Yeah. And that is a problem. That's right? a Just huge problem. Right there. That's yeah. one of the biggest problems I see. And, and I kind of ask people, like, if you don't understand this Black Lives Matter, you know, if you have no one in your life who truly and honestly fears when they send their child out, out the door of what could happen to them. If you don't know anyone in their life who is honestly afraid of interactions with police officers because of the outcomes of so many, if you have no one in your life that has that perspective, that's a privilege and that's something you might want to consider just walking across. But we don't, we're segregated in so many ways, whether it's through religion, through area code, through neighborhood, through schools, which are a huge problem. You can live your whole life and never have to have that interaction or that close personal friendship to where you can understand that perspective. From a rational perspective, it's hard to ask people to care about what they don't right. know about. You I know, think fine, it's exposure. Just for starters. Yeah. yeah, it's exposure. Expose yourself and talk to other people. Just have a conversation. Because um, mm -hmm. if you don't know, you don't know. I mean, you, if you never had that, but if you are exposed to it, it's like I've given you this information now. And what are you going to do with that? Do you sit with it or do you try to do something different? And it might not be something that happens right away, but maybe a couple weeks down the line, maybe you're like, you know, so-and-so said this to me and I'm thinking about it more and now I want to know more. But if you've never had to be exposed to it, there's, I can totally understand how that happens. Really. But, but let me ask you just a very practical question. I mean, given how obvious it is that, that racial inequity mm -hmm. is a major problem right. in the United States, right. why isn't there more national conversation, productive national conversation, where we're at least chipping away at yeah. some of these issues and making some kind of progress? Uh, or, or, or maybe you're seeing conversations that I'm not aware of. I think a lot of it, um, education, 
Um, we're not exposed to this. Um, it's not something that is, we don't get taught a proper history. So right. we assume that we know this, you know, the creation story. It's almost a myth of America and how it was created. You know, they came over, they were persecuted, they created this democracy here, every man created equal. Um, and it's yeah. this really beautiful story. And, you know, George Washington was this great person, Abraham Lincoln, but there's all of these other dynamics, these men, that we don't talk about when we talk about history. And so we're not learning the real history of this country. Maybe the play Hamilton, just a little bit, does open up some of that, just because these aren't demigods, these right. are right. flawed people. They're like, actual human beings actual who are human flawed, beings. but we've yeah. kind of created them into these deities of almost to a degree of like, they're larger than life, mythical human beings and all good. And they're not, they're like any human being. They had good, they had bad, they had flaws and they were working under pretenses that we don't have anymore. But I think education's a key piece of it. But I think that the the discussion of race and racism is a moral discussion that they, we frame it in that way and it's not. You know, you either, good people can't be racist, you know, and, and if you're bad, you are, and it's a good or bad thing, and it's not. It's this whole institutional systemic thing happening and we don't talk about it in those ways. It's the issue maybe of white privilege and just uh, white unawareness of white privilege, yeah. uh, an issue. Because I, I, I mean, I can remember moments in the Obama administration where the president, who was, you know, um, very sophisticated right. person, really aware of a lot of things right. going on in the culture, and you could see him sort of tiptoe up to something and yeah. kind of back off yeah. because he knew there weren't hearers for what he needed to say. Is, is that me, or, or just a lot of conversations that don't? happen because of we're all afraid of the sensibilities yeah. of, of white people that mm -hmm. don't want the finger pointed at them. Yeah. I think that is a big part of it. Um, and I think the word privilege throws a lot of people off because I think the way we frame it and the way they think of privilege is kind of in this monetary financial, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I don't have any privilege. And that's yeah. not really what we're talking about. And so when they hear that, they shut off and they don't want to hear anything else or the conversation stops or becomes confrontational. I also think that there's a fear of of blame. You know, this isn't a blame game. This isn't you did this or you did that. It's like, how do we start talking about these deeper issues and, and get to a place of better understanding? That's a tough one. I've seen that come up a lot where people will say, well, I don't want to be uh, made to feel guilty. Right. I don't want to feel bad. And or I didn't do it. It was my, it. That's, that's so long ago. And it's about, it's not me. And, and somebody needs to just say, well, it's not about you, right. but it's our common history. Right. We need to talk, talk right. about that. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, I actually have spoken to different student groups over the last year and the first part of it is this history piece of like these are some of the major themes of an eras of tribal policy with the United States government. Here's this assimilation piece, here's a reservation time. And I know the kids are probably like, why are we talking about this? But I said, I need you to understand this so we can understand where we're at today. So in the work I did, I worked with 567 tribes. This is the demographics of the, the community I work with. We have people who live in LA and New York, Chicago. Was this when you were with the USDA or uh, which uh, this period? Was, uh, part of it was during the USDA, um, part of it was earlier this year when I was taking some okay. time off. But um, it was just understanding we're all, we're in these cities because of the relocation period. We have the school systems called the BIE school under this system and just trying to have them understand all the systems at play and how history brought us to this point in time. So to connect them to that. I grew up in Oklahoma because of the relocation and because of the removal act. Mm -hmm. um, that directly impacted me and my family. You as people living here in New York, you came here and your family has their own story of how they got here. You have your own policies whether they're things that happen in other parts of the world or here in the United States that brought you to this place and time, and you have to understand that. I also wanted them to know that we look at history in numbers, and it's really easy to not, like on the Trail of Tears, 4,000 Cherokees died. It's just a number to them, but it's like when you start thinking that that was 4,000 individual people, that was a mother, a father, that was a child, an auntie, and there's all of these they all were individual people, part of it. That's devastating. And we just think of it in this, that was so long ago and now's now, but it all connects to where we're at now. You make such a good point about change is gonna really be at many different levels yeah. and many parts of the culture, et cetera. Yeah. This, this would just seem to be a situation that so obviously calls out for national leadership. Mm -hmm. Somebody to lead the way and model it and mm -hmm. open up those conversations and be encouraging to people that they, they, they can survive those conversations. Right. It's not gonna devastate them. Right. We can learn about our history. Right. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not even sure what the question is here. Why, why don't we have those leaders? Where could they come from? Where would you think they might come from? 
Uh, yeah. We just seem to need that leadership so much. We do, and I'm, I'm not really, that answer is one that I'm not really sure about either. I mean, there's so many, I don't know if it's a coalition of people. Um, I don't know if it needs to be more grassroots. It's nice to have that national kind of person or place to look, but I, I don't really know. Maybe it's spaces like Encore where we have these people. It might not just be one, but collectives of people that can do that. The um, National Conference of Race and yes, Ethnicity where yes. people come from all yeah. over the country and and have these conversations. They have these yeah. conversations in spaces that they're comfortable with, other people who are like-minded, and then they go out and try to spread that word to where they go. So maybe it's these places where we all come together and have time to have these conversations and refuel because I think we need that and that happens here, um, and then go out and try to teach other people and bring other people on board. So next year, bring more people with you so we can have more people going out having these conversations. A, a lot of leaders at a lower level, not the big, right. you know, Right, not just this one kind yeah. of person or these, because I think that's how we look at leadership and power anymore. Like, you know, even um, with president, I think, you know, there's this idea of like this one person holds all the power. And I think it needs to be a lot of people doing this work. And I don't think it can change without a lot of people. If you work. were queen of the world mm -hmm. for a day mm -hmm. and could do whatever you wanted, what two or three changes would you do that, would you make that you feel, felt would really make a difference? Um, I think one would be getting rid of queens and kings. <laughs> no more one person in charge of everything. Good idea. Um, and I think two would be, um, I would love to see our history taught in a way that is more reflective of the true story. Um, because I think that would help us maybe understand each other a little bit better. Um, I don't, it's not gonna change everything, but I think if we can at least be honest about where we've come from, and our history is, not always beautiful, it's cruel sometimes, it's bloody, it's sad, it's, it, there's so many things, and it's hard, it's painful, our history's painful. Um, and I think growth is painful, and I think maybe that's one of the reasons why we have so many people who are afraid to have those conversations, because it means looking at things and seeing things differently, and any kind of growth, physical, emotional, spiritual, it hurts. Yeah, it's a yeah. very painful, painful thing to do and I don't think a lot of people really want to do that especially if you know you're struggling just to get by I'm worried about putting food on my table I don't have time to think about you know anything else going on around me so right yeah but it would be liberating I mean it, it, would. Would, be, it would bring us together it um, would. A, a, as a community it would expose them to different ideas and understanding of oh so that's why I have a better understanding of how these people are living here and the cycle of poverty continues because now I understand redlining or I understand, you know, the segregations of schools and what that means and what that looks like in the actual real life um, outcomes of that. Thank you so much for being with us. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Join us next time for more current conversations.